Thanks to Twilight, vampires are all the rage, but stay with us so we can talk about how to correct that bad bite that you may have. Kentucky Health addresses the health care concerns of all residents of Kentucky and surrounding states. It was created by Dr. Wayne Tuxen, a colorectal surgeon practicing in Louisville. Here is your host, Dr. Wayne Tuxen. Hi, and welcome to another segment of Kentucky Health. Today, we want to talk about bite problems. You know, when you have a thing, when your jaw sticks out a little too far, or maybe it's not far enough, and the teeth just don't quite occlude. And we have two experts with us today, Dr. Christian Howell, who's with Mattingly and Howell Orthodontics, and Dr. Chris Babcock of Kentuckiana Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons and Associates. Thank you both for being with us today. Thank Thanks you. for bringing us on. Now, you know, I must admit, uh, we think about biting. It's such a routine, normal thing that we do during the course of our day. But tell me, Chris, Chris, Chris <laughs> tell me, what goes on when we actually are taking a bite of something? Well, it's actually a very complex maneuver that involves the joints, the right and the left side, the muscles of the, of the jaws, the mouth and the face, and of course the way the teeth fit together. And it's amazing how we take it for granted when it's working fine. Mm -hmm. It's when it's not working fine that people can have problems with the way they function and the way that they look. What are some of the tooth problems that may occur when you see this? Uh, many different things can go on. You can have individual teeth that uh, become bad in terms of the nerve or the inside of the tooth decaying over time. Mm -hmm. People can have cavities that can be caused by bad diets, damage due to trauma, any number of things that could cause the tooth either to be repaired or the bite to be fixed by either an oral surgeon or a dentist or an orthodontist. How often do you see people who come in without having had some trauma but just have something where their teeth aren't aligned properly? Well, for me, it's every day. <laughs> I'm an orthodontist, so that's what I do. I manage uh, the way people bite together. Most people have some difference in how their teeth fit together. Sometimes it's very manageable, and mm -hmm. I, they come in and we don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Other times, uh, it may need anything from braces for just a few months to braces and surgery that may last a couple of years. What's the big deal? So a person doesn't have a good bite. Well, I mean, you know, we can have people that, that have a situation where their teeth don't fit together so poorly mm -hmm. that they literally can't chew their food, which can affect the way they digest their food, their general health overall. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a really important part of this is the person's self-esteem. Mm -hmm. I mean, if somebody has a, a deformity, we call it, where the teeth don't fit together, oftentimes it's a skeletal deformity that involves the jaw bones of the face. So we're talking from cheekbone to maxilla or upper jaw to the mandible or lower jaw. Um, some of these people you might notice walking down the sidewalk, you know, they need some help from someone. Uh, we like to put things on a scale of one to 10, mm -hmm. one being someone who really has a minor problem that probably could be just fixed with braces and someone on a scale of one to 10, again, 10 being very severe where they obviously need help. And we'll be able to show you some examples here today of people who really, uh, you'll be able to tell the difference from what they started with and how we were able to help Are them. Are there other problems that can occur, for instance, swallowing problems, or even breathing problems when you talk about this? Significant problems. If we have people who were born with hypoplasia or lack of proper growth of the lower jaw mm -hmm. and their lower jaw and chin didn't grow out enough, uh, they can have uh, significant sleep apnea even from a young age. And we know now through all the different studies that have been done that people that have sleep apnea uh, whether they're young or all the way into adulthood, have a significantly higher rate of heart disease and early death and a, a lower quality of life. Hmm. Now, you mentioned correcting some things with braces. Uh, I see you brought a couple of models with you today. Mm -hmm. So could you kind of take us through what types of braces there are and what is it you're trying to do with these braces? Sure. About 98% of the cases we treat can probably be done with any kind of surgery modification. So for the most part, people will come in and we'll evaluate their needs. Mm -hmm. um, most involve having braces or some kind of an appliance put on, appliance being on the outside or the inside. So we treat bones and teeth to make changes in the face with or without surgery. Mm -hmm. um, this particular kind of brace 
uh, is just a metal bracket that goes on the outside of the teeth mm -hmm. and it allows us to have a handle to move the teeth by. Braces just work by pressure. You mm -hmm. apply pressure, the bone changes position and the teeth move with it, regardless of what kind of system you're using. So the basic kind is just the kind you see all the time, the metal type of bracket. This is very similar in how it works. It's just a different color. Mm -hmm. It's less visible, so patients like it simply because you can't see it as much. Not many people really like to wear braces. <laughs> I sure didn't. <laughs> Another type is a bracket on the inside uh -huh. where you don't see it at all from the outside of the face. And some people request that simply because they don't want to be seen with braces on at all. And most treatments can be done with brackets like this. It's just a different type, different need for somebody. Mm -hmm. And then finally, just by applying pressure again, you can use a clear plastic aligner like that huh. that just goes over the teeth. And you can use anywhere from three to 50 or more of these used in two week sequences mm -hmm. to progressively move the teeth over time. So you're trying to move the teeth back? Uh, or Wherever they need of? to go for everything to fit properly. Mm -hmm. You can move them back, forth, up and down, mm -hmm. left and right, rotate, any of those things. And each one of these mechanisms works to do that. So they're all about equal in terms of their effectiveness for the patient? Uh, the braces work very similarly. There are some things that we can't do with the clear aligners mm -hmm. uh, that we can do with what we call the brackets that go on the teeth directly, mm -hmm. but for the most part they're all very useful. Uh, is it difficult? I see more and more even athletes wearing braces, so you can wear these and participate in sports and this sort of thing? We have children in every type of sport you can imagine. What about adults? Adults can fit braces Same too? way. Maybe 25% of my patients are adults and they all work it into their lifestyles. Maybe not as uh, uh, willfully as kids do, but they all manage to make it work. Wow. That's, that's, so there's no end point where you have to say, no, you're too old for braces mm, or... I've seen patients up to in the mid 80s. Mid 80s. Huh? And for trauma, mainly for those, mm -hmm. but people that have come in that want to change probably in their mid 70s. Wow. Chris, when do you get involved in this situation? Well, oftentimes what will happen is a uh, patient will come to our office either as a referral from their dentist or they have seen us around or sometimes uh, an orthodontist like Dr. Howe will send them in and we'll uh, evaluate the patient both clinically, so looking at them, looking at their mouth, looking at their face, looking at their jaws, and then radiographically as well where we'll get x-rays and look at the way that the teeth fit together and the way the jaws have grown mm -hmm. and we'll be able to assess in <coughs> consultation with the orthodontist and the dentist that are helping take care of the patient if there's a surgery that needs to be done, what kind of surgery it is that is indicated, if there's a way we can do it without surgery, mm -hmm. and then once we figure out what we have to do, then uh, with lots of communication between ourselves, we get the patient to the point where we, have, we can mount their models up on our articulator, mm -hmm. get the teeth so that they fit together on the, on the models, and if I can get a patient's set of models to fit together well on the models, mm -hmm. I can duplicate that in surgery. And so once we get to the point where we have a set of models that I can fit and the patient is of an age where their growth is stopped, mm -hmm. they're healthy enough, we've got everything squared away financially with insurance companies and everything is authorized. Mm -hmm. At that point, the last step is get them scheduled, take them to the OR. Generally, the surgery takes, depending on what we're doing, between an hour and maybe four hours. And in that time period, we can make tremendous changes that end up impacting a person's life positively for the rest of their life. Is there a difference in the types of things that you do now, say maybe 20? 25 years ago? Yeah, there's been tremendous changes in technology throughout all of our different areas of society and has definitely affected what we do. Mm -hmm. I trained uh, down at UofL under Brian Alpert and George Kushner, got out in 2003, and when I was in training, we were using the same current techniques we are now, but training with those guys who've been doing this for quite a while, we were able to learn the history of how these kind of things were done back in the 60s and 70s and so forth. And now, a surgery that uh, is, a, is a major surgery, uh, may have taken 10 or 12 hours in the past, can be done in as little as, as I say, one to four hours, uh, using uh, <coughs> what we call little mini screws and mini plates. They're uh, mm -hmm. the same kind of screws that an orthopedic surgeon would use to hold like hip joints and mm -hmm. knee joints in position, made of uh, pure titanium. And we use those little mini plates and mini screws. They hold the bones in place, and a lot of the time we don't have to wire the people's teeth together. So the next day they can literally be chewing soft foods and, and enjoy a, a, a post-op that is low morbidity. 
this is not an incredibly painful thing you might expect wow. as people describe their jaws being broken yeah. and things and we can we can make this uh, easier on the patient. Let's than take a look at some of the examples that you were kind enough to bring in with you. Uh, we're going to okay. take a look at the photos. Now, what are we looking at here in this young lady? Well, here we've got a, a young woman who was uh, referred into uh, our practice by an orthodontist. She's from one of the outlying counties, and uh, this is a picture of me asking her to go ahead and smile for me. In the process of communicating in this particular case with the Medicaid, mm -hmm. we have to show the insurance companies what the problem is with the patient so that the insurance company understands that it is medically necessary and it's mm -hmm. not just a cosmetic procedure. So what is the so, defect that she has there? When you look at her, what in this view, you can kind of get an idea that her cheekbones are a little shallow. In the mm -hmm. next view, uh, hopefully we'll be able to see her looking to the side and there you can really appreciate that the cheekbones are very shallow, the chin is very strong, mm -hmm. and the, the kind of the operating word here is harmony. Her facial structure is out of harmony and what we want to do is we want to bring it back into harmony. She would be on that scale of one to ten, probably about a five as far as difficulty. Now, let me ask you though, a simple person such as myself, what it looks like is that the lower jaw is sticking out farther than the upper jaw. Is that what you mean by harmony? I agree with you and, and there's a lot of optical illusion here because oh. you're right when you look at that the first thing you think is my gosh she's got a really strong chin but the truth is is that her main problem is she has a really weak mid face or mm -hmm. cheekbones. I the see. upper jaw or maxilla is really weak but it does draw your eye to that chin but the surgery she really needs to have done involved upper and lower jaws but we want to pick a, a surgery that's going to give her the biggest cosmetic benefit that we can. What do we see here on this next slide then? This is, a, this is an x-ray of the, essentially the exact position she was just in. We're looking at the side of her face. You can see how the lower jaw looks like it's really sticking out yes. way beyond the upper jaw. The truth is her main diagnosis here is weakness of the upper jaw, mm -hmm. surprisingly. So the lower jaw is actually okay. It's the upper part of her face that's not the right. I would okay. say she is a four-fifths upper jaw problem, one-fifth lower jaw problem. We actually treated both in this case. Mm -hmm. So then what do we see here on this next shot? The next photo is a picture of the way that her teeth fit together. Uh, this looks to me preoperative. So what you're seeing is the lower front teeth out in front of the upper front teeth. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you, Chris, why does she have braces on now as opposed to at the time of the surgery? Well, nearly all patients before they go to surgery have to be what's called decompensated. We want to make the situation as abnormal as possible before they're treated mm -hmm. for surgery. So we want to align the teeth. We want to exaggerate the problem that they have as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then when the surgeon comes in to put everything together, it fits as perfectly as it can because of that. So we'll have already lined up the teeth, got mm -hmm. them in the proper position vertically and, and in all other directions. And then we'll actually take another, another set of models and x-rays and photographs before they go to surgery, mm -hmm. make sure everything fits. Then the surgeon, dentist, orthodontist talk, make sure that we're all in agreement that everything fits as well as it can with the articulated or fit models mm -hmm. that Dr. Babcock was talking about and then they go to surgery. Now they might be in braces anywhere from three to 14 months sometimes prior to going to surgery to make sure everything goes well. The goal is for him to be in there as little time as he can, mm -hmm. make everything fit perfectly and not have anything that he's got to deal with. Okay, on this next slide, I guess we're seeing the end result of what you've done then. Chris. Yeah, Ralph took us to a, a slide there that shows a very good shot from an angle that allows you to see how far the upper jaw is back or the lower jaw is out. Yeah. And Dr. Yeah. Howe mentioned a word there that is really important. He said decompensate. And yeah. what that means is when a patient's uh, skeleton grows, whether it's their leg skeleton, arm skeleton, or in our particular case, the facial skeleton, mm -hmm. they compensate to be able to function. It's amazing how human beings can adapt. We can live in the Arctic, we can live in the jungles, we can adapt to our environment. And what happens is when the person's facial skeleton, the upper and lower jaws don't grow properly, mm -hmm. the teeth want to, instead of being aligned up perfectly, yeah. if the lower jaw is out, the teeth lean back and the upper ones lean uh, forward to try and get to where they can fit. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Howe's job and the orthodontists are to decompensate that dentition and then we can come in and fix it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this next shot then, this is the after I guess. I was able to get her to smile at this point. <laughs> this is her a few months post-operation. Uh -huh. She's well healed and just looks better, feels better, her teeth fit together better and she really will have a better life and because see, of this. The next slide is what's showing the lateral view again and how does that look? So now... Looks normal doesn't it? Looks normal. Looks normal. That's yeah, amazing. I think so now, too. Now with this model that you have with you now, mm -hmm. 
Could you show me what is the, one of the first things that you have to do at the time of surgery? Well, you're trying to fix these what things? happens is we might have a set of models, for example, this one right here, and the patient's teeth fit like this. Mm -hmm. And it could be that bad where there's nothing fitting together well at all. Hmm. What we do is we have our orthodontist and our dentist go ahead and get the teeth perfectly ready for surgery so that I can take a set of models, mount them up on what's called an articulator, mm -hmm. get the teeth to fit the way they want to. And what happens is then I'll spend Sunday nights, which my wife is not too happy about that, but I'll go down to the lab for a couple of hours, look at all the x-rays, look at all the photos, get all my models set. And we actually make what's called a splint or a series of splints. They're custom made by the surgeon, made out of acrylic. And what they do is they allow us to position the jaws in surgery. So we go ahead and take the splint, we wire it to the upper teeth, we wire the upper teeth then to the lower teeth, we have the bite we want, mm -hmm. then we go ahead and put the jaws where they need to be. So, the, so mounting in an articulator and the braces have to be there for us, allows us to go ahead and do our surgery. Are you having to cut the bones themselves and That's then right. put them back together again? That's right. That's exactly right. What we do is called an osteotomy. So mm -hmm. we are cutting the bones with a saw. Mm -hmm. Uh, oftentimes the patient will come in with their parents to talk with us about it and they're very nervous and yes. they describe it as you're going to break my jaw bones, aren't you? And what I say is we're not getting in a bar fight here. <laughs> this is a very technical, very controlled environment where it's done very gently. Mm -hmm. We gently section the jaws so they're free from the mid face and the higher tissues and we're able to manipulate them and move them into position and then we hold them with that pure titanium screw and plate. Or sometimes we still wire teeth together, but it's only for just a few weeks if we have to. Are you going from the outside skin into the jaw or do you do this through the mouth? 90 something percent of these surgical maneuvers are done through the mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we have to do lower jaw forward mm -hmm. procedures, lower jaw forward, we make a very small incision on either side. Same kind of thing you do for like a laparoscopic procedure so we can get some instruments through there without really stretching the mouth too hard. Mm, okay, let's take a look at this next patient that you are kind enough to bring along with you. Now, describe to me the abnormality here. This is actually a young fellow who was sent by Dr. Howell and Dr. Mattingly. And I saw him, it's been many years now. He came in because he was getting tired of having people point out that his face was not straight. And okay. so when you look at his face, you can see that he essentially has a 45 degree angle to the left. Mm -hmm. And it is very obvious that something is not right. And what has happened in his particular situation is the jaw condyles, so the lower jaw is like this, the actual condyle on one side deteriorated and the other side grew. Oh. And so it pushed him like this and made him very uh, asymmetrical. Okay. And so what happened is we brought him in, we did a thorough examination, took our x-rays, you can see in this picture where the, the lower jaw really looks like it's off to the left. And what happens is as that condyle grows and the other one deteriorates and everything starts to get off angle, mm -hmm. the, the upper jaw tries to hang with, it compensates with that, so it starts to go too and everything ends up being off. And so in this particular case, we had to correct him at three levels. We had to get the upper jaw flat, mm -hmm. we had to get the lower jaw back so the teeth fit, and then we had to get his chin back too. This is one of the mm -hmm. cases that Dr. Howell and Dr. Mattingly and me and my partners talked about a lot before and after because the result in this one was very good and very stable. What do we see on the x-ray then? So this is just showing again that same pattern you were talking about, how things are just shifted to That's the, exactly right. to this the is right a, of the screen? This is an x-ray again, just the way we were looking at his face just before where we're looking straight at it and you mm -hmm. can see how his chin is off to his left. Yeah. Well, that seems like rather challenging. What's the next slide here? This is an x-ray like you'd get at the dentist's office where they look and see what your wisdom teeth are acting like. It's called a panoramic x-ray. Mm -hmm. And it really shows the condyle on the patient's right, which is the left side of the screen as mm -hmm. we look at it. And then on the, the left side or the right side of the screen is the condyle that's deteriorated and how everything is wanting to drift to that side. So you see more of a dark space over there on that's that exactly right side right. of the screen. That's exactly how I'd describe it too. So now your approach to this patient, again, you go inside to his mouth, That's right. free that up? Or? His entire surgery was all done through his mouth. The incisions we keep in, uh, as small as we can. Mm -hmm. This particular slide right here just shows the end result where everything has been brought back to straight. Mm -hmm. That surgery right there takes about three or four hours to do. And the patient spends two nights in the hospital, was wired together for three weeks. And at two months, it's completely healed and back to eating regular foods. Are these done under general anesthesia or is the patient uh, awake or sedated when you're doing it? This is a general anesthetic done in a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. Patient is intubated through the nose. Through the nose, so that That's keeps right. the tube out of the way so you have full access to the mouth. It allows us to make sure the teeth are fitting together properly without having to manipulate the tube at all. Mm. Chris, how difficult is it to get those braces on these people 
before the surgery? Is that a very, ch are you going to have to use a particular type of braces or this is any one of the variations that you brought with you would be applicable to try to get these patients ready for surgery? Normally with surgery we're using either a bracket that's on the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I've had one patient that's actually had braces on the inside of the mouth that we've used or on the inside of the teeth that we've used. So typically there are braces on the outside whether they're tooth colored or metal. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll be in braces anywhere from three to 14 months before surgery. They're applied just like you would with any other patient. Mm -hmm. uh, before they go to surgery, we make all those measurements, make sure everything fits together properly when they go to surgery. And then when they get done, uh, when they come out of surgery, we'll probably see them anywhere from three to 12 months more to fine tune everything, make sure they're comfortable in their bite, make sure they don't have any concerns or considerations. There's always a little bit of change that has to take place after the surgery. We're dealing with half a millimeter, he's dealing with parts of centimeters, so the moves are a little bit bigger with, with the oral surgeon than it is with the orthodontist. What about that patient, the 98% that don't have to see Dr. Mm -hmm. Babcock here? Uh, how, once you get alignment the way you want it, mm -hmm. Does the person have to continue to come back to have follow-up or have to have readjustments of their teeth or anything like that? Typically, once everything's where it's supposed to be, where it's comfortable, where it looks normal and everybody's happy with the situation, mm -hmm. the braces are removed. Uh, a patient will go into a retainer that they'll wear. Typically, we suggest six months of wear full-time. Take it out to eat and brush your teeth. Take it out if you're doing contact sports. Six more months after that, a few hours before you go to bed and while you sleep, mm -hmm. and then after that indefinitely at night. Because we know as people age, their mm -hmm. teeth continue to move. Uh -huh. And for 25% of the population, it's a little bit that's not noticeable. Mm -hmm. But 75%, they're asking you, you know, do I have to do this again? Mm -hmm. So we advocate full-time night wear pretty much indefinitely. Chris, is the biggest reason for you getting involved in the care of a person, is it because of some medical problems <clears throat> or is it aesthetics? You know, that's a good question. The vast majority of the people that we're operating on with this particular problem are deformed from birth. Mm -hmm. It's a developmental problem. That's why medical insurance has no real problem covering this mm -hmm. because we consider it to be in the same kind of category as cleft lips, cleft palates, club foots, mm -hmm. spina bifida, and things like that. This is a real hypo or hyperplasia of the skeleton. It just happens to be the face, mm -hmm. and it just happens to be that when we line things up properly, people look better. Mm -hmm. So instead of looking deformed, they look normal. Do you see any other improvement in your patients after they've had this kind of work? We have an example I'd love to show you where we have a patient who had a significant deformity of her facial bones mm -hmm. preoperatively. When we were able to get the facial bones into proper position, we were able to move the lower jaw and chin forward. She started to exercise more. She started to feel better. She started to have a better diet and she lost weight and she looks like a completely new person. So this whole thing is, is not only are you just fixing the face, but you're really fixing the person themselves. That's then. very true. I, don't, I think that uh, the, our person is made up of the physical being, mm -hmm. their, their mental thoughts and processes, the spirituality. And we take someone who, like the example I showed earlier, where she would not smile. She was very unhappy. And within the process of going from braces through surgery, we turned her into a young woman who was vivacious and full of happiness and had no problem smiling all day who, long. Who might not be a good candidate for this type of work? I think that when we have patients that have significant medical problems mm -hmm. that coexist with this, we always have to figure out whether they're a good candidate for surgery in general. Mm -hmm. I would say most people who come in that have deformities of the face, we will try and help in some way. Cigarette smokers? Does that cause them, a problem? We want them to quit. Problem as far as healing with the bone and all that sort of thing? That's right. We, it's been shown in study after study by our orthopedic surgery colleagues that the chemicals that are found in the cigarette smoke cause the blood vessels, the very small ones that mm -hmm. run inside bone, to shut down. And so there are plenty of orthopedic surgeons out there will, that will just not operate on a patient if they smoke. Our part of the body is a little bit more forgiving for healing. Mm -hmm. We have lots of blood vessels in the head and neck. Everybody knows that's a really vascular area. So our wounds tend to heal even with smoking. But well, if, we could get, if we could give a couple of words of advice to the people of Kentucky mm -hmm. who watch the show, number one, quit smoking. Number two, brush and floss your teeth. Well, I want to tell you, I want to thank you both very much. Um, if you sometimes you're sitting there looking and something doesn't look quite right, or you find that your bite isn't quite right, see your dentist. Or if you have questions, 
Try to contact either Dr. Howell or Dr. Babcock. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to direct you and provide uh, solutions to your problems. But clearly, though, if you think you have a problem or your family members think somebody may have a problem, check it out because there may actually be something there. I'd like to thank you both for being with us, and thank you very much for joining us on this segment of Kentucky Health. I wish you all good biting. <laughs>